Season 4 of Angel is brought to you by LinkedIn. You already know LinkedIn is the world's largest professional network. It's also a better way to find great talent. Go to linkedin.com slash angel and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. Assure is the leading provider of special purpose vehicles and fund administration. With over 5,000 completed transactions and $2.5 billion under administration, Angel listeners can get 20% off their first SPV at assure.co slash angel. And Zeus Living gives you a place to come home to for trips of 30 days or more. Stay with Zeus for beautiful, thoughtfully furnished housing. Go to ZeusLiving.com slash Angel for $200 off your first booking. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Angel, the podcast. This is episode four of season three, and we are cooking with oil. The guests have been transcendent, uh, and people are just raving about the Dan Rose episode. I think you're going to love today's as well. We've got somebody who uh, has worked at what most people would consider two of the top ten uh, venture capital firms here in Silicon Valley, Greylock, and now Benchmark. And we're going to talk about Sarah Travel's transition uh, from one of those firms to another and her focus on consumer. Mostly. You're a consumer investor mostly. Yeah, I mean, nowadays, yeah, a lot of marketplaces, B2B, B2C. Yeah. And then, you you know, nowadays you can't ignore SaaS if you're, you know, doing actually consumer investing. I mean, a user is a consumer at the end of the day. And so... It feels like there. the two things are starting to overlap a bit. Slack oh, sure. feels like a consumer product, mm -hmm. but Slack is a enterprise company. Business, yeah. Go to market motion. Go to market motion. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, just you know, it. A lot of it, it depends on how these companies will first get adopted, and then second, how do they get paid to do that work? Right. And so, the go to market motion just means that there's a salesperson at the end of the day who's making a phone call probably right. and talking to someone about the benefits of paying for Slack. Right. And it starts typically without a salesperson. People Correct. just sign up. Yes. And then at some point, what, 10, 50 users, they get a phone call or I an think, upsell? Yep. Who knows? Yep. But that was the first company, I think, that grew like a consumer company while having the revenue model of enterprise. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Or can you think of another <laughs> one that did that? Well, I would think, I mean, Yammer preceded Slack. And sure. I think a lot of that was a similar story of yeah. the kind of bottoms up adoption. And, there, and look, Slack isn't the only one. Dropbox did that go to market. Yeah, Dropbox would too. be actually the one that makes sense. But did they ever really go enterprise? Did it ever work for them? The, they certain like they, I remember, I don't remember how many years ago, probably two or three years ago, they hired a real head of sales, yeah. like a kind of the, the person that you'd expect to make those big phone calls mm -hmm. and, and get those big contracts. And so they went, they went real into it. And I think to have done a really good job executing yeah. on that. Uh, and when you look at marketplaces, let's start there. Why are VCs? Mm hmm obsessed with marketplaces. Hmm. Obviously, our mutual friend, or your colleague, my friend, yeah. Bill Gurley, uh, who I think you work pretty closely with. Y yes. Was he the one who recruited you? It, it's a team effort. That's what. That's the stock bench. It's so mark, true. Can, I know, cannot. Thing. Who made the first phone call and said, hey? That was Peter. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, really? Yeah. And how does that go? Hey, we're the Yankees. You're kind of on the Mets or you know mm. whatever it is. Yep. Like, hey, Greylock's a good firm. But anybody in the industry would say Benchmark's a better firm than Greylock. You're not going to say that. I will. <laughs> they're very, they are. They have better well, performance. They're very Undeniable. different firms. They're structural, structurally very different. How so? Well, one of them, you know, Greylock has taken the approach that most venture firms have, have done right now, which is they've pursued a bigger fund, a platform team. You know, they probably had the best talent team in the Valley when I was there with mm. Um, Jeff Markowitz and Dan Portillo, and then an amazing marketing partner, yeah. associates, principals, right. senior partners, junior partners, but it's a way of scaling what they do. Yeah. And Benchmark, we've taken the approach of not scaling what we do because right. we don't believe it scales Right. to do early stage venture investing. And Benchmark um, was very intentionally built and we've had Andy Radcliffe on the podcast oh, uh, three times, four mm. times now. Yeah. One of the most loved guests on the podcast. And they set up that specific firm to be equal. Yes. So if you come in and you've got five years experience and Bill's got 20 and Andy's got 30, whatever it is, everybody gets an equal slice of the pie. Mm -hmm. Greylock, not like that. Not at all. 
Right. That's part of the difference. But, it, you know, it's it's not just a compensation thing, although yeah. that's what it, that's kind of the way you reduce it from the outside is that it is. But what happens, what you feel when you're on the inside is that it's actually the culture of the firm and the organization mm. of the firm, gotcha. which makes a really big difference when it comes to both, you know, deciding on new investments and then also supporting the investments that we've already made. So most venture firms yeah. have a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. There are senior partners or there are principals, associates, yeah. all this kind of stuff. Benchmark just said, hey, we're going to have, what is it, six partners? It's five right now. Five partners. Yeah. And uh, everybody has an assistant, maybe? That's right. Kind of old school. But no big, giant associate principal pool. Correct. Or and, a talent team. Or, or a talent you know, team, those, marketing team, yes. all this like extraneous stuff right. that Andreessen Horowitz threw into the mix. Yes. And yeah, we believe we can't delegate any part of our job. Can't delegate any part of your mm -hmm. job. That's fascinating. Yeah. So it's the job of that singular board member to help recruit. Correct. Yeah. The way I think about it is most of the platform stuff that mm -hmm. other people had, and I benefited from this and felt this when I was at Greylock, is really about scaling the GP. It's not about scaling the founder. Huh. And so what we do, um, the work that we do is like we believe that in order to find, you know, help a CEO find the best CRO, I can't kind of throw that over the fence to mm. a talent team right. and then have that talent team talk to the CEO, generate a list of candidates, talk with those candidates, and then play this game of telephone between me talking with the talent team, then talking yeah. with the CEO, the CEO talking with me, then talking to the talent team. And instead, I have to be the person right. that's doing all those calls with you, that's you know, as, mo as much mind melded with you as possible right. so that we find the best person because- right. More efficient. It's, it's more efficient. We actually think you get to a better outcome because right. we're as much on the same page as we, as we possibly could be. It also shows a level of dedication to the founder and company that delegating doesn't. That's, yeah, that's what we, that's the way we think we can be the most effective at our job. Right. But from the other side of the table mm -hmm. as a founder, yeah. if Bill Gurley's like, well, I'm going to go find that CMO and I'm going to do it. That's my Bill Gurley <laughs> impersonation. It's ridiculous. <laughs> he, has, he has about 5% of that swagger. That's what we do at the poker table when Bill's making I a decision. It. I love it. Well, I guess I'm all in. When Bill Gurley <laughs> says, I guess I'm all in and he puts those chips in, you're you're, yeah, just public. I don't mean I to unlock it. Bill Gurley's I game, it. but when he says, oh, "I guess I'm all in," <laughs> that's literally like Doyle Brunson or you know, like John Wayne stepping onto the you know. He's never bluffs. No, he's got some bluffs in him. He's added bluffs in the in right. the in the in the later years. He added some bluffs. Okay, yeah, but if he's going to do a bluff, I would say it's probably going to be what we call in the business a semi bluff. Mm. He's got a maybe he's I got a, it. a flush draw, I but he's got like it. a pair, but or a mid you know bottom pair plus a flush draw. Yeah. So you know he's got to have some. He's not reckless. He's not reckless. Yeah, absolutely. As opposed to Chamath, uh. <laughs> super reckless. Reckless, kind of his his best <laughs> attribute great. is a little recklessness. Uh, so Peter Fenton calls. Mm. How does that happen? He texts you, hey, call me, or he emails you, <clears> hey, can we call, or he says, can we set up a call? How does that go down? Well, Scott Belsky introduced me. Okay. Um, and it was, look, like it, the- Explain who Scott Belsky is. Uh, so Scott Belsky was, at the time, one of the general partners at Benchmark. Yep. Um, he had been a founder of a company <clears throat> called Behance and an angel investor in Pinterest, yep. which and I got to know him through through that, um, just and just an all around great person. So he he just sent me an email. He said, "Hey, look, Peter is always looking to meet, you know, rising stars and venture, and wanted to grab a coffee." Whoa. And so, well, you know, you get that big smile on your face. You get that email. You you that's get a great email. You get that email, and you're not going to say no. Of course, you're going right. to meet Peter. But it's a great email. It can't. You, yeah, you, the great email. It's yeah, of course, and. When you read that email, do you say, they're recruiting me? Would you say they're dipping their toe? What, what is your, when you talk to your friends or your spouse or whatever, significant other or your mom and dad, or I don't know who you talk to, you say, I got this email, it's interesting. What do you say? Well, I didn't even, I didn't mention it to anybody at the time because yeah. I was, I had been at Greylock for a year. Yeah. I was pretty heads down yeah. at Greylock and yeah. so... I just kind of saw it as getting to know someone who I can learn from right. in the industry and then and and just 
assume that that's all you're being recruited i for the yankees you i got the feeling that this was just a getting to know you conversation like maybe this could be getting recruited to the yankees in four years but maybe not now that's right you meet the team one by one one by one yeah takes a week or two oh no that's takes this is over the course of several months you covertly meet the team you got to meet them in places where you're not going to get noticed you can't go to the battery and have a meeting with these folks you got to do it on the dl that's true so you, you do these meetings just at like a coffee shop or you go to a Walmart and meet in the back <laughs> by the butter. What do you, How does one do those covert meetings where you know that if people see you at the Rosewood, you, you're going to get a phone call from your colleagues mm-hmm. or something? How do you do that? Where do those go down? They Yeah, they go down in, in conspicuous places, but it's really? not hiding. You're not, it's not a, it doesn't feel like you're hiding. Okay. So it's not like... Some American CIA, correct? Yeah, where you're dropping notes yeah, yeah. to each other and I'll say that when it started to feel real? like more real yeah. was when we did dinners together. Oh, and that's when you know that's like look for benchmark, um, and and really for all venture partnerships, like you really are bringing on not just someone who how they pick, but it's also a person who is becomes part of the culture of your partnership, especially with a small group where mm. each person's personality really does change the culture of the group right and so uh we had casual dinners to really get to know each other in that context wow and that's when you start to feel like all right let's find something a little bit more private right you need a private room correct or they've got that triangle desk that oh, special yes. desk you know about the desk of course i know about the desk come on <laughs> When we get back, we'll talk table. about- Table. It's a table, not a It's desk. a table. Yes. That's true. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's a table. We'll describe the table when we get back. You should Bill's have Peter first. on and to he'll just, talk. He has a very nice uh, uh, monologue. monologue. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We, Peter, we try to get Peter on the podcast like 20 times, I but imagine. I think Peter's been beat up by the press and like- it's just Has like what, he? I think he's taken a couple shots here or there. And I think just, you know, when you start getting beat up in the press a little bit, like you just, what's the upside of coming I'm, on a podcast or talking to any press today hmm. for people like us? I- I agree with you on that point. Uh, actually, yeah. not relevant to Peter because I've never seen any bad stuff. And I think like Harry Stebbings always talks about how the 2020 that he did, the 20 minutes VC that he did with Peter is the number one downloaded podcast. Yeah, because podcast. Peter's podcast shy, right? That he could do be. a lot. Yeah, yeah. But the point you made about public figures having conversations, like uh, it just feels like there's so much more to lose for people right. than to gain by talking to, by, press. By talking to press. Yeah, right. there's there's a real thing there. It's it's there's a negativity in the press right now. There's uh, I, I think it's Twitter. You think it's attributable think to it's Twitter. Twitter? Yeah, yeah. Because Twitter, it's a it's like f- first of all, like the the character restriction, the way that you know it's a headline, and most people just read that and then ret- and how easy it is to retweet without yeah. any nuance. Very tribal. It yeah. just yeah it creates these flash mobs right. where people like. Um, retweet content without ever reading the actual know, story the actual story they read someone else's take on it which is always biased and yeah, hot take here we go the hot take like and and it creates this like terrible uh like mob effect that right. i think is it's just really unfair and not not the way humans should interact sh- should interact i agree I, and my thesis on podcasting and its ascension yeah is for I, folks like us yeah who are trying to discuss nuanced points, you cannot worry about me misquoting you. Right. I can't misquote you. You can stop this interview at some point and just be like, Jason, I think it's a silly question. Uh, Here's how I look at the world. Mm. Now, if you were to say, if I was a journalist, Jason, back in the 90s, and I said to you something, and you'd be like, that's a silly question. I mean, I really don't think that that's the right question. Here's how I look at the world. Mm. That phrase that I just said, that's on the cutting room floor. And then the next thing you say, or the thing you say that's most provocative right. is the lead. Right, right. Right? Yep. And, and that just devolves the trust between mm. the subjects and the journalists, which is where we are today. Yeah. This is completely gone adversarial. When we get back from this quick break, I want to know at the moment where the deal and the actual offer gets passed across the table from <laughs> Axe Capital to you, <laughs> right? And Axe slides it over and Wiggs is in the room and- <laughs> Taylor, you watch Billions. That's the best show. The greatest ever. We'll talk about our love of Billions in segment three. So good. And then actually, surprise for you, uh, Mark Andreessen heard you're on the call, and I know that they tried to recruit you. He's going to just ask a question at the end of the pod uh, when we get back on Angel the Podcast. 
hiring the right person is the major unlock for you and your startup. You know this. There are two things that you waste way too much time on. One is hiring people. Two is raising money. You can solve this problem by using LinkedIn jobs because they screen candidates with all the hard and soft skills you're looking for. This way, you can hire the right person quickly while still running your company. Well, LinkedIn looks beyond just the simple work skills. They put your job in front of qualified candidates who match your business requirements perfectly for things like collaboration or creativity, adaptability. That's how LinkedIn makes sure your job post is seen by the people you want to hire, the right people. You want to get that well-rounded person, not just they, they have the skill, but they also have those other fluid intelligence-like abilities. It's no wonder that a new hire happens every eight seconds on LinkedIn. Let me give you an example. We have a company we invested in called Takeoffs.io. They are an AI-enabled building materials marketplace. So what they do is they'll look at a floor plan and then say, oh, this is how much wood you need for the floor. Here's how much sheetrock you need. Here are the screws. Just by doing computer vision on that floor plan. It's a brilliant idea, right? You don't have to do a bunch of material sourcing. Well, they were looking for an AI engineering lead but they had to have a PhD in computer vision because they're scanning all of these beautiful PDFs. Well, they found somebody on LinkedIn and that person has now been with takeoffs.io for over a year and they have been a game changer for the company working on many of the most important projects. Examples like this are why people rated LinkedIn jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering qualified candidates. You're gonna find the right person for your business today. And you're going to do that with LinkedIn jobs and you're going to get $50 off the five zero baby. Just visit linkedin.com slash angel. That's right. LinkedIn.com slash angel. And you will get 50 right now from J Cal and our friends at LinkedIn terms and conditions apply because we're giving you the fitty. All right. Thanks again, LinkedIn. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right. We're off to a hot start with Sarah Travel. She is at Sarah Travel. 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 Keep saying travel. God, right. I'm sorry. You get that a lot. I do. Sarah Tavel. We both grew up in New York. I know. Interesting. Yeah. I'm a kid from Brooklyn. I'm a Manhattan kid. You're an Upper, upper West, West Side, Side girl, huh? We could have like uh, maybe Lincoln Center. We could have both gotten off yeah, some when I went to Fordham somewhere. Yeah, I went to Fordham at Lincoln yeah. Center at night. You went to Stuyvesant. I did. Really hard to get into, mm. but a public school. Yep. Very diverse. Yes. Very vibrant. And when you went, it was on the West Side Highway. It Correct? Was, just opened. It had just opened. That's right. right. Yeah. Way downtown in Manhattan. And when you went, they didn't have the bridge yet. They put no, the bridge up later? They did have the bridge. The bridge went up. Yes. Brand spanking new. Because that was the big issue. Kids were crossing the West Side yeah. Highway, 12 yeah, yeah. lanes. And I, people, I, I don't know if it was a student, but somebody had gotten killed crossing the West. I remember that. Yeah, it was really tragic. Yeah. Then they built the bridge. And then the kids still would, would cross the... West Side Highways, yeah. kids but, are apt to do. Yes, but most, like, the bridge was a very good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Stuyvesant on the West Side Highway there with that cafeteria looking out on the Hudson. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is a special institution, is it not? It, Yeah, it's a special institution. What was special about it? Like, what was it like? I mean, honestly, I think the special thing was that the kids that were there were extremely driven. Yeah. Um, you Bright know, it kids had driven. Yeah, and it, it it was it was like a very it, it was, you said diverse. It was um all very heavy on uh, immigrants. So, right. I mean, a lot of I mean, probably 60% Asian when I was there. Right. Um a lot of Russian immigrants, a lot of people who it was their shot um, right. at a really great education. And I'd say like the, the teachers there were a mix. Um, right. Like it's, you know, it's an intense public school where you have 34 kids in a class, eight right. classes a day. So it's still public school. Yes. So you have to make your opportunity. Correct. It's not like somebody's going to stop the class and be like, oh, yeah. sorry, you're a little bit behind. Let's right, right, take right. A, pause the whole yeah, class. No, it was a factory. It's it was a factory. a factory. And I, you know, honestly, by the time I got to college, that. It had kind of crushed the love of learning out of me, and it took oh, really? me a couple of years to to back into to it? rediscover that. Yeah, because yeah. it just you know it's it is the way that they did it was like how much work can someone take? And that was the them. way, and that was the way that they would separate the you know the wheat from the chaff. Like that was right. the way that they would really figure out mm. who deserved the ninety five or whatever. And it was just a very very competitive school. Yeah, it was very competitive. I yeah. remember yeah, I went yeah. to Severian High School in Brooklyn. Uh, and we had some friends who, you know, went to public school in yeah. Brooklyn and then wound up in Stuyvesant, but that was the goal. Yes. Where'd you wind up going to college? Harvard. You went to Harvard. Oh, oh my Lord. Undergrad. Undergrad. And then MBA or no? No. 
just went to work. Just went to work. I just want to make money. You know what? That's refreshing. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. I was a kid from Brooklyn, and you know what I wanted? Yeah. Money and power. Yeah. You know why? Why? I didn't have it. Nobody yeah. had it. Yeah, yeah. Where I came from, nobody had money. Nobody had power. I knew yeah. one person who had a Mercedes, a doctor. I it. didn't care about power. I, I wanted money. I was a terrible student in college because I just worked. Really? What'd yeah. you do? I sold, you know, I did a bunch of things. I sold ads for a lot of publications. Really? I started a house painting company that became a general contracting business. Like, I just did anything I could to make, to money. make money. Where did that come from? What did mom and dad do that put that little fire in you? I, or you did know, you see, like, entrepreneurship up close or something? You know, my dad was always a really hard worker. And mm. so you you definitely saw that model. And, you know, we were well-to-do, but... There were definitely fights about money that you would, you know, you couldn't See, help but in my house. Yeah. I would say nine of 10 fights my parents had, money. I think that was for us Maybe too. Maybe eight out of 10. The uh, other two were my dad having a couple too many drinks. Okay. Mine were re- religion. It was it was oh, money yeah. and religion. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And my parents had a very, very <coughs> loving marriage. But right. like, I remember my dad getting mad at my mom about cereal, you know, and how much it costs. And so- What are we doing? You- <laughs> There's 365 at Whole yes, Foods, exactly. and you're buying Captain Crunch. We got what are the we doing big that? jumbo ones that what? would go stale. This Costco, we could go to Costco. Yeah. You get. I'm. Turning. My mom would die if she heard this. <laughs> <laughs> I am literally. I'm 49 now. I'm older. Yep. You're like 10 years younger than me. What are you? 35? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, 10 years younger. I'm 38. You're 38. Okay, yeah. you look great. You look like oh, you're 22. Kind. I look like I'm 65. I don't know what happened. I look in the mirror. I'm like, wow. I'm turning my. I'm literally turning into like the classic dad where I'm like who left the refrigerator open the nest has eco mode for a reason do you not care about the planet you got the heat on 72 and the doors open I'm I live in Hillsboro yeah. it's 70 degrees in Hillsboro and if somebody puts the air conditioner on to 68 or they put it on to 72 to make it warm yeah. I'm like we're in Hillsboro we're in Northern California it's 70 every day you don't need to touch the thermostat there's a sweater that's the thermostat <laughs> yes. you either put the sweater on or you put a t-shirt on. If you're hot, you take off your pants, you put on shorts. That's it. That's how heat works. Yep. <laughs> it's called clothes. But you got to burn oil. I'm, I'm literally going mental. <laughs> There's something that happens when you have children you and a family. You appreciate our da- my dad created, I have four siblings. He created a, an incentive system so that if we turned the lights off and we kept energy costs low, he yep. would split the the gain with us Ooh. so that I was oh, the person. Nah. And I we're was, wondering yes. where you became love of entrepreneurship. <laughs> He gave you a, a metric. <laughs> who, who would have thought? Yeah. He gave you, you like, what do they call it? Like in a startup where we have a key metric. Um, An OKR. He gave you an OKR. Yes. Yeah. He's like, Here, here's how your comp yeah, yeah. works. What a compensation Comp system. for 20. Yep. Comp for, tw- t- uh, for 1998 is going to be based on? <laughs> yep. That's exactly Electric what bill happened. savings. Yeah, Here yeah. we go. Me, touch his thermostat. <laughs> My dad within five months <laughs> come running. There he goes. <laughs> this is the greatest thing, though. I got my revenge. How? The Nest has an app. I open that app up sometimes. Yeah. I see what's going on with this thermostat in the middle of the day. You know what I do? You turn it down. Eco mode, all thermostats. (laughs) I can do it. Boom. All three thermostats are now in eco mode. Go ahead. Go change them. (laughs) Nobody else even logs into the Nest app. I know that. Nobody asked me for the password. And then people are like, what's going on with the heat? It's not working. My wife thinks sometimes that the nest is just flaky. I'm like, yeah, that <laughs> nest, I, there's bug reports all over the internet. It does that. It's a great idea. I'm so glad you mentioned this. I, I just That's yeah. what I say. I just say, listen, you know, there's bugs. It sometimes defaults back to eco mode. Yeah. It's using AI. I yeah. told my wife this. Don't want to tell her on the show. Don't <laughs> clip this. Don't tell your aunt. Neither of our parents or our families can watch this episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's a moment where all of these dinners, whatever, three, four <clears throat> months in. Yeah. Where the actual offer happens, how does that go down? Is it a phone call? Hey, we want to make you a formal offer. Or somebody says, they float it. So what are you thinking, Sarah? How do, how do they actually put the offer on the table? Oh, you're really Email, getting into it, it, aren't you? I, I think people are just curious on a mechanical basis mm-hmm. how it goes down. I mean, we get, we get there's a courtship. There's a bunch of meetings. There's checking out that the culture fits. But let's assume that's mm-hmm. all done. Is it like an official letter or is it just somebody going to walk with you and you're walking across? I, for me, it feels like an embarcadero walk. You get somewhere on the ferry building, you hit the blue bottle, you get a little macchiato. Yeah. And then Bill Gurley says, so what do you think, Sarah? You want to join the team? <clears throat> that, that's my view mm, of it. Yeah. I'm thinking like Brian Koppelman on mm-hmm. the billions. Mm-hmm. A nice big vista, a little walk. 
You get the iconic espresso, and it's in glasses, not paper. Mm. They put the espresso down. You walk away from the blue bottle. So what do you think, Sarah? Cut. Let's go for the promo for next week. I How close it. am I? Uh, you know, the way it works, well, first of all, the letter doesn't happens way after because yeah. the nice thing about an equal partnership is that <laughs> there's not really a negotiation. It's yeah. like- One fifth. Yeah. That's essentially what happens. And so it really is this conversation at the end, which, you know, I'll, I'll say kind of early on, there was, there was a point at which the one-on-ones had happened. Mm. And then there was this point of like, well, we're, we actually- this is what this has been about. Like, we want to have a conversation with you mm. about potentially joining Benchmark and just right. getting to know each other more. Yeah. Uh, and at that point, I actually said no. Um, whoa, whoa, what? Well, I, you know, I was, I was at Greylock. For Greylock, 12 minutes. Well, Greylock had been really good to me. Right. And I felt like it wasn't, it didn't feel right. I wasn't ready. Yeah. It just didn't feel right. I felt like I had- year? I was there for, by the time I left, it was, yeah, a little over a year and a half. But yeah, I mean, you're like old school like me. You want to put in four years. Yeah, I felt, I mean, more than four years. When a you fun. join a f- partnership, it's it's more like a marriage. You know, you're, yeah. you're, you're, the expectation was that if things work out for both of us, this is the last job that I'd have. And so there was something that really didn't feel right. And so I, I actually said no. We walked away. <gasps> um, wow. And then I ended up having a call uh, with Rich Barton, who I had met through um, through Chris Saka, actually. Rich and Barton <clears throat> had done Glassdoor? Uh, he has done a number of companies, Expedia, yeah. Zillow, Glassdoor. He's a baller. He's an un- he's like, like an operating machine, right? He's so freakishly talented in so many different dimensions. Yeah. It'll make you angry. This is what I hear. Yeah. Hey, uh, Producer Nick, lock it down. I know. He's so good. Well, why but, is he not on the pod? And so what happened then is like he, he was basically like, look, what do you have to lose? At the very least, it'll make you better at your job. And so... Okay. And, and there was some truth to that. Like, what did I have to lose? I was, if I got to know Benchmark better, at the very least, I would learn how to do my job better of within course. Greylock. And yeah. so, yeah, just tell me how the Yankees work. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly it. And so I, and it's one of those things though, that as I got to know Benchmark, I just realized it was, it was like one of those things that you once you saw it, you couldn't unsee it. Right. That it was just, it felt like, oh, this is how it know, should be. This is how I want to like spend my career, and this is how. I think I'll be best at what I do is right. working with these people on this structure. Wow. And so it was kind of this moment of realizing like, oh yeah, I, you know, I, I love Greylock. I love the team there, but I really owe it to myself that I should explore this further. Mm. And then it got to a point where it just, the fit started to feel more and more strong through right. each of those interactions that we had yeah. until finally it was kind of this moment of being like, all right, shall we do this? Wow. And, and the answer was yes. So they just said, should we do this? Basically. Wow. That's that, That's how you say it. Should we do this? Yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, there was, they had a much better, you know, Benchmark knows how to close. Uh, uh, and they had a much, they had a much better way of doing it. But really? But I'll keep that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they basically gave you their top 10 list? Top 10 reasons why. <laughs> top 10 Sarah, reasons. <laughs> like the Letterman show. <laughs> Number 10. <laughs> Twen- one fifth. <laughs> just. Well, I mean, if you, and also if you think about it, uh, as a woman in venture, mm-hmm. you're the first female partner at Benchmark, is that right? Correct. And <laughs> you think about this moment in time, mm-hmm. uh, I think y- you look at how much Alien Lee, how much effort she had to put in yeah. over a decade or whatever, and all that work, all that fighting, uh, you look about at... Um, um, who was the other partner at Kleiner? Ellen Powell. Oh, yeah. Y- you look at all of the, the folks who came before you and fought their way through the industry when it maybe wasn't as um, easy for women mm-hmm. and maybe actively hostile or even, you know, in Ellen Powell's case, obviously, harassment. Um, and, and, you know, obviously, she didn't win the lawsuit, but there's some bad yeah. stuff that happened. So it's, it's Clearly. no perfect victims, but obviously, <laughs> there's bad stuff occurred. Mm-hmm. Um in a way, for me, it's almost like your th- this latest stage of the venture capital firms, the elite ones, yeah. finally putting women as equal partners with check writing ability at equal economics. This is an important moment. Is it important? Was that important for you in a way? Did you feel a sense of history or importance as a female in the industry, or did you just think, "Listen, I'm a great player. That's it." 
It's not about that. You know, I think by that point, you know, I was the first uh, female partner at Greylock oh, as so well. Like getting- <laughs> and so, well, and you know, and when I joined Bessemer, I was the first woman that they'd hired in, I don't know, a decade or so. And right. so I, you know, at this point, I think like what it more felt to me is like there are, there are two ways to attack the problem of there not being enough women in kind of check writing venture roles. Uh, one of them, which is a path that I've chosen, is to try to disrupt the hegemony from the inside. Right. And the other path is what a, p- a lot of people have done very, very successfully, Aileen Lee, uh, Kirsten Green, and others, to create f- separate funds outside yeah. of that hegemony and then, and then disrupt from the outside. And I think these two, that's like the combination of both is making a lot of change happen in the industry. Do you feel any sense of I'm the only women in the room in these situations? I've never been as a white guy in my life. I I can I can count on like a small handful Mm -hmm. of times when I've been not the majority of the room in business. Um, Certainly as a you know, socially, I've been, you know, the minority uh, in the room Mm -hmm. on a demographic basis, gender basis, race basis. But in business, it it very rarely happens. Yeah. Well, when I started at Bessemer, so I was a year out of college, you know, I was new to the investing world, new to the technology world. I'd, I had been a philosophy major in college. Oh, really? Um, and I was, you know, I was the youngest. I was the smallest. Um, I was one of 25 and I was the only woman. I couldn't, it was my first experience of being the only woman and I couldn't not feel it. You know, I felt like. Yeah, 24 to 1 is, a, you know, yeah, 4% of the room yeah, yeah. being female. And, is it, and it wasn't, the, you know, the, it was, uh, the room itself would be probably called 15 people and there was other rooms, you know, it was all over video, yeah. but you would still feel your otherness right. because it was my first experience. I would say like, you know, that's, I joined, I joined Bessemer in 2006. So right. that was, and you know, there was the number of women VCs I could look to as role models was, I could count them on one hand yeah, and all of them were on the West Coast. I didn't know any of yeah. them. Um, I was in New York at the time. And so like, as my career progressed, I, you know, it went from being honestly a daily struggle, like something that just felt like I couldn't participate with, I just, I couldn't participate in the culture the way that right. the other, like my peers were because right. I felt my otherness. Right. But it's gotten to a point for me now where, and I think, you know, context is everything too, where I like, I notice it sometimes certainly, but it's not. It's more more often than not, ninety eight percent of the time, I don't notice it. And you know what? And I'm I'm assuming this, and you can confirm it for me because I don't want to mansplain this. But I gotta think, walking to a room, even at Benchmark, which uh, would be twenty percent female, which is a lot mm-hmm. more than two percent or four yeah. percent, as we just discussed, in the room, knowing I am equal economically, yes. then that's got to take the edge off because. Everybody is making decisions and everybody's paper is the same. Yeah. Again, it's not about it, the, you know, there's, I kind of think of these systems as you have compensation, you have the organizational structure, and then you have the culture. And mm-hmm. it's those three things that yeah. interplay that make you feel. I, I remember when I started at Greylock, I felt like, okay. I'm the new partner. I really got to build my credibility and like go up, you know, the rungs of a ladder of like what a GP is at Greylock. But when I started at Benchmark, you just from day one feel like an equal. Mm. And and that's not a compensation thing that creates that because you don't feel that in the same way. It's it's the culture of the people. And it's, you know, yeah. it is the like when it, well, I remember that there was a we had to make a decision on something. And it was like having five CEOs on the phone at the same time, like, yeah. you know, because there's no one person that makes a decision at Benchmark. Like, right. there's, it's literally the five of us making a decision together, which means that we're terrible at operating Benchmark and we all, we're all doing what we do because we want to invest, not operate. Right. Um, but, uh, but it's, uh, it, it just feels very different. When we get back from this quick break, I want to know, why the decision, how the decision making process works. If you feel mm. passionately about an investment, you did Hip Camp, I believe. Correct. And we had um, yeah, the founder on the podcast. Was she was podcast. amazing. Yeah. yeah, she's amazing. Um, I want to talk about like when you're, br- what is the um, process of bringing that to the Yankees, right? Mm. You're, listen, this is a, a, a storied franchise benchmark at this point. 
and you're the new one and you're bringing something in uh, and an idea. Was Hip Camp there or was that at Greylock? It was at Benchmark. I want to know what that was like. Was that the first deal you did? Uh, no, Chainalysis was the first deal I did. Great. So I want to talk about when you bring those two deals specifically to the... Mm-hmm. What is, how does it work when mm-hmm. we get back on Angel of Podcast? If you're an accredited investor, you need to understand what an SPV is. That stands for Special Purpose Vehicle. This allows 250 investors to put up to $10 million into a company with only one entity on the cap table. So if you're an angel investor with a bunch of rich friends, you can start your own syndicate powered through an SPV. Here at launch, we couldn't be more pleased with our partnership with the team at Assure, A-S-S-U-R-E, by the way. They power my syndicate, which is called thesyndicate.com, which is the largest syndicate in the world. We have about 4,000 members now. And Assure is the leading provider of special purpose vehicles, SPVs, and fund administration with over $2.5 billion in AUA. That's asset under administration and over 5,000 completed transactions. The folks over at Assure have developed an innovative software platform called Glassboard to automate the entire investment experience from entity formation all the way to IPO. It's beautiful. It's slick. And Ashley, who manages my syndicate, loves the interface. Not only do investors love it, but founders love it as well as it keeps their cap tables nice and clean and simple. So to get 20% off your first special purpose vehicle, again, SPV, that's what I want you to remember. Remember, visit assure.co slash angel. That's A-S-S-U-R-E dot co slash angel. In fact, the first time I ever did one of these in SPV, you know what it was for? Calm.com, the meditation app. And that worked out really well. Yum, yum, skis. Thanks to Assure for powering my syndicate and for offering this discount to angel listeners. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Sarah, travel is here. God, I said travel before, and uh, it's only because I haven't been sleeping at night. I'm with it's you. not easy. Yeah, you've been up too? Bad one last night. Yeah. yeah. Three o'clock? Two yeah. o'clock? Yeah. Three, that was what yeah, I was yeah. made between two and three. Yeah, yeah. I was like, this is getting ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I'm up all night. Mm-hmm. This Bloomberg and the debate know. got me. I know. I got two or three companies in crises at every given point in time. I got guests in from out of town. I just got everything yeah. going on at once. It's not, the job of a venture capitalist, there are some very anxiety producing moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always tell people who are thinking of going from operating to venture that you trade stress for anxiety. You trade stress mm-hmm. for anxiety. Explain the difference. Well, in, in when you're operating, you can control the outcomes, right? right? Like you you feel the stress of, am I going to be able to execute? Am I going to be able to, you know, get this done by this date? How, you know, it, it just, it's in your control. And so you can stress about it versus what happens in venture is you don't really have any control, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're... When you're when you're looking for deals, you're just planting seeds and seeing what sprouts. You know, you don't really know when where the next deal is going to come from. It's not an outcome that you necessarily can control. You can only control the inputs. And then with the companies that you work with, like at the end of the day, it's the CEO and their the yeah. team that's running the race, and you're on the sidelines trying to cheer them on and and coach them. But your ability, you you can't stress because you're not running it yourself. You have the anxiety of, mm. am I going to be able to influence them in the way that I think that they need, you know, could be useful right? so that they're able to be more successful in that yeah. race. And you, so you have this like low grade anxiety that can just be like, oh, yeah. it, you know, 12 months of runway, 10 months of runway, <laughs> six months of runway. Is this, inv- are they going to cut the burn or are they going to just keep racing towards the cliff? there's yeah. and you're like hey you want to pump the brakes <laughs> people are like why would we pump the brakes like, is this the one that you had a 2 30 a.m uh, wake up three, about I, you know, at three of them yeah. at the same time and you yeah know, it's, yeah it's when your portfolio gets large enough mm. just rule of big numbers yeah you're going to experience it all oh, totally and i'm currently that's what it turns out late 2019 and 2020 is about for me like make 200 investments over a decade yeah get ready yeah because all the stories you heard mm. are going to be on your doorstep. Mm-hmm. And by the way, you're the highest profile and you're the, pers- the right. first investor. So guess what? Mm. Your name is associated most with the company. So it's yeah. on you, not the other people who followed on who aren't on the board or aren't there. Yeah. Well, it's it's uh, my my mom always, like I'm one of five, and my mom always says that she's only as happy as her least happy child. And I feel that wow. with companies that, wow. you know, you're always like, it doesn't, if the one that's working 
it's working. It's working. You know, and so yeah, you don't, don't screw it up. You don't. Yeah. You. I mean, you try to push more, but like at the end of the day, like where your emotional energy ends up going is to the ones that are struggling, and so right. that's kind of the reality of the job. And it's it's hard to see that because everybody's like, oh, you're in Uber, you're in Robinhood, right. you're in Calm, whatever. Like it's great, you know. And you're like. Yeah, those are great. Yeah, they don't need me. These they are the ones. Yeah. Literally don't need me. Like yeah. my phone calls with Travis, you know, for a large period of time were like just really? Mm. <laughs> like with Alex and Michael from Calm, it's just like mm-hmm. a- really? <laughs> They're like, yeah. I'm like, we that, <laughs> that's the monthly number or the quarterly number? That's the monthly number. That that's the monthly wait, there's more money in the bank yeah. account this month than there was last month? We're not <laughs> We have I've never profits. Heard of that? Before. I'm like, wait a second. We're building up a war chest. I thought that was only for Apple. Like, what is going on here? Um, Good for them. For Calm. Yeah, they've done an amazing job. It's, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this question as well. The most significant like um, company, not the most successful, but the one that makes you feel the most warmth. Warmth. Just warmth, like just warms your heart, kind of thing. Mm. And for Calm, that that's mine. Mm. Because at some point the founders <coughs> told me, we had met with like 70, 80 VCs, yeah. investors, and they all said no. Got a couple of 25, 50K angel checks here and there Grey from Lamp friends. was one of them, I remember that. Yeah, and no VC would give them the money they needed. Yeah. And I had just, Naval had just given me the URL of angel.co slash Jason slash syndicate. And he said, check this out. And I said, what's a syndicate? And he said, well, and he explained it to me, like SPV. And I'm like, what's an SPV? Mm-hmm. Special purpose vehicle? How does that work? I was like, all right, well, I'll just tweet it. So I tweeted it, and like 300 people joined my syndicate. Wow. And then I told Alex to come. I was like, I have the syndicate. I'll put 50K in the round from my little $10 million micro fund. That's me and my poker buddies mm. and uh, friends. And I'll syndicate it. I think another 50 or 100 could come in, and 328,000 came in. Hmm. It was the first syndicate I ever did. That's great. Four $5 million post, I think. We own 5% of the company. And they said to me later, you know, we were going to shut the company, we were thinking seriously about shutting the company down if we didn't close that syndicate with you. Hmm. And the fact that it overperformed and we got that money was the reason Com's still here. That's awesome. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. But the fact that they told <clears throat> it to me and they know the impact that has on me, it makes me want to go to work every mm-hmm. day. You have one of those? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, and I don't- The uh, warmth. The, the, I'm not choosing it because it was uh, the highest profile one, but I feel that with Pinterest. I mean- when I, I when I was you know we uh, did the Series A for Pinterest when I was at Bessemer, the and Series A yes, and it was a for f- an image board. It was a yes, it was a very you know it was a four or five person company at the time. Like it was, um, it was misunderstood by everybody in the valley. Like we you know I was an early user of the product. I just loved it from the first time I used the product. And and I loved it so much and I just was watching it on, you know, Alexa Tracker, which was this, you know, yep. it was a web it was a website at the time. Yeah. And just saw it keep on going up and keep on going up. And I just realized like this is the one. And I thought it was the most competitive deal ever. Like, you know, I just assumed that it was multiple term sheets. And um I went on to, you know, we invested in the Series A and then I ended up joining the company because I was so excited about it. And at my going away party, Ben confessed that we were the only term sheet. Wow. And it was kind of a similar story, which is like they, you know, they had gone up and down yeah, Sand Hill Road. It, that's, um, it's a I mean, I, who knows? Like, I'm sure yeah. they would have found something somewhere. But it may not like, be where it is today. It was, yeah. it, I'll put it this way, which is that it was an important moment for the company at that time. Right. Very important. Yeah. And this is the time where you're the, the only woman in the room. At mm-hmm. Bessemer, yes. as we talked about before. And this is a product that is primarily used by women. Mm-hmm. Correct? Correct. 70%? At the time, it was even more so. Yeah. and Oh, yeah, because it's now become such an SEO juggernaut that so many people are mm-hmm. winding up on it that there's men winding up on it, but maybe not going direct traffic. I wonder if the direct traffic still is 80% women. Probably yeah, in that I don't range. Know. And this shows the... The real opportunity for having people different than a bunch of white was, dudes from Stanford. It was they the, didn't see it, did they? It was the moment I realized. Like it was, it was the realized first what? moment that I realized that being a woman could be an edge. You uh, know, because like in, in venture, you're always looking for an unfair, your own unfair advantage, yes. and your unfair advantage can come from 
the operating experience you had where you really understand a space it can come from just diving deep and mapping out a space and understanding like all the players it can come from just years and years of experience or it can come from kind of your own experiences and who mm. you are and pinterest was a product that none of you know none of the men got i mean no. jeremy levine at bessemer did get it like right. i think he um i don't know if he got the product but he got the metrics which were right. The retention there was undeniable. Real. It was undeniable. I mean, it was super. There was thirty thousand registered users at the time. It was super early, right? But like, it was the utilization per user. It the was number of pins they did. Yeah, the yeah. number of boards they created and the repeat usage. But you know, everywhere else, like it was one of those things where people just thought it was going to be a real niche site. Uh, tell me about the fight to get it funded. Did the did you have to fight? extraordinarily hard or did they say okay you're this enthusiastic let's do it no it was you know i was lucky because i was working with jeremy levine and so he at that point i mean he'd already done i think linkedin and yelp and so okay. he uh Understanding he UGC? had the standing yeah 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 and so User generate content it was powerful uh, it, yeah and that was actually the thesis which was that we had yeah. had at bessemer a lot of success with user-generated sites right. um yelp LinkedIn um, and and social commerce was one of those spaces where I you know we had also done a bunch of companies in the commerce space diapers.com which became Quidsy which got acquired by Walmart uh, Mark yep. Laurie um, and and just really believed that you know there was going to be an opportunity for a company that was the intersection of U UGC and commerce mm. and was looking 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 for what that would be and that's when you know I came across I Pinterest. was on the board of this company called This Next at the time oh yeah in LA Gordon Gould and we would have these discussions like yeah Pinterest doing pretty good too and, mm -hmm. and it was really the same idea there were there were like yeah. five or there six five, social I commerce the fancy supply yeah this this next like there yeah. were a bunch and they really had this fascinating moment because they were UGC all of a sudden you had this flow through traffic yeah. coming from uh, Google mm -hmm. to the landing pages and then if the landing pages had any kind of monetization on them a, a Google mm. ad that then took you to you know a search ad um, you, you all all of a sudden were starting to monetize at this 25 to 50 dollar CPM or RPM whatever mm. you were doing and it was it was like wait wait there's something here yeah but they actually came up with their own the sponsored pin yeah when did they come up with that idea? And when your partners and when you were analyzing the Pinterest investment, this was an era of don't worry about making money, mm -hmm. let's just get to scale, That's correct? That's right, correct. When did the discussion, because this, this has poisoned the mind of a lot of founders, mm. I believe, is that yeah. they're like, you don't have to worry about making money. Mm. Is that true? You don't have to worry about making, just worry about getting a lot of users? What's the truth in that? And do people over index on that did they know what they were going to do as the as the model did well, they have the idea that it would be sponsored pins in yeah, the beginning yeah from the earliest days that i can remember it was just obvious i mean you had what pinterest was was the intersection of kind of two big companies google with like the discovery intent search intent and they had that first native ad unit which was the you know the sponsored links right and it, we you know it made like the wonderful thing about sponsored links is that they actually made the search results better. Right. Because they're super high quality. Like it's only going to be a high quality company with a high quality landing page that's going to spend money to right. have that be like. Not going to be a spammer. That's correct. And it's also, it's like conversion rates take into account. So it creates a great experience. And so it always felt like, number one, there was going to be something like that for us at Pinterest where we would have a native ad unit that was mm. going to be a sponsored pin that was actually going to create a better experience for the users than not having it. Right. And then at the same time, we had an engagement model that was more like Facebook, where we had people coming in and spending a lot of time on uh, Pinterest in the same way that they'd spend a lot of time on on Facebook, but no one spends time on Google. It's a very transactional right. system. And so we felt like we had that intersection right. that would create a really big opportunity. That's fascinating because Google, if they do their job correct, they get you off of Google very fast Correct. and you don't come back. If you come back, it means they failed. Right. At this point, Google has started to own, try to own the user more and more. Right. And like, you know, the actual, when you do a search, yeah, they give you, you, the answer. you have to scroll down like 16 pages, it feels it's like, so to get brutal. to the first link. It's yeah. so brutal. I mean, I think this is going to be their undoing with it's, the Justice Department. It's already happening in yeah. Europe, which is... 
if if any regulator, this is a message to <laughs> regulators. I can tell you how to stop Google. I'm sorry, Sundar. If you want to understand how to stop Google, all you have to do is record. I'm looking into the camera here so you can make this into a clip. Record 1,000 users doing a Google search, randomly mm. selected. Record their screen. After they do 10 searches, then ask them, of the 10 links they picked, which ones were paid and which ones were not. They will not know. I would say 10 to 30% of users actually know if they clicked on an ad or not. Yeah. In other words, 70 or 80% of the uh, commerce going on on Google are users who are confused and don't know they clicked on an ad. Hmm. And that is the mobile experience on Google. If you do a mobile search, forget about the web. The web, they're kind of put the little tiny ad chiclet, mm -hmm. but they are, Google is, and I'll say it right here, and you don't have to say this because I know that you maybe want to have a relationship with them in the future, but I don't care. My brand is to not care. Uh, they are deceiving users yeah. at a scale that's never happened in advertising before. Is my theory right or wrong? Is there, do I, I thought have you any? said you weren't going to ask okay, me. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, does my theory, have you heard my theory before in the back halls of conferences and other people are afraid to say it publicly? Have you heard it come up before that Google is deceiving users at a mass scale and that most users don't know they're clicking on ads? I don't think I've ever heard that particular argument. What, I, what you do hear and you just, you, you can't help but see it is, um, is the fact that they are they just have this privileged position in their own search results right. and so anybody else like that can participate in it just becomes pushed down more and more mm. and so it's uh and it's not necessarily the best thing for the user either because i would much rather see a yelp you know review and and the yeah than the fakaka then like whatever yeah google local yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. like there's four reviews right. and you're like there's four thousand reviews on yelp you tried to buy yelp marissa you lowballed them, you insulted Jeremy, you didn't get it, and now you, you created this fight for life. Like They could have just been generous and let Yelp have a business hmm. and not push them down to the seventh or eighth yeah, click. It's... That was some hardcore gangster stuff when they started with what they did with Yelp. I think that was where they kind of opened themselves up to this massive criticism. When we get back from the final break, I want to talk about the two first deals you did. Sure at Benchmark. That was my teaser for the last one. Mm. But you told me about your time at Pinterest, which I also want to go deeper on. Mm. So we got to go deeper on Pinterest. Okay. We got to uh, maybe finish up a little of the Google and mm. maybe antitrust uh, mm. at the end of what should happen with these big companies because we all are faced with this with our portfolios. And then your first two deals into the partnership at Benchmark where you're an equal partner on the Yankees. Top three firm. You, Sarah, are now one-fifth of one of the top three firms in the world already. I mean, what a career when we get back on Angel. <music> Zeus Living makes it easy for you to live wherever opportunity takes you. Yes, whether you're connecting with investors on the other side of the country or opening an office in a new city, Zeus offers smart, furnished housing that's cozy and convenient. Zeus can accommodate 30-day stays, and they include all the important stuff like cleaning supplies, kitchenware, toiletries, and options like downtown one bedrooms or a single family home in a neighborhood you want to explore, flexible booking dates, immediate availability, and minimal paperwork. All of these come with high-speed Wi-Fi, obviously Xfinity and a smart TV. That's all standard. You don't have to think about it. You can just move around, be nomadic. And Zeus is the hassle-free way to streamline your next stay. You can find Zeus Living, Z-E-U-S, in San Francisco in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, Seattle, the New York metro area, Washington, D.C., and even Boston. Rest assured, you, your family, and your pets will be secure with their digital locks and 24-7 on-the-ground support. For a limited time, Zeus is offering $200 off your first booking for Angel Podcast listeners. Wow, that's very generous. Get the 2 hundy, not 1 hundy, not a 50, 2 hundy by going to ZeusLiving.com slash angel. That's 2 hundy right now on JCal and Zeus. Visit ZeusLiving.com slash angel and explore all their beautiful homes. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, the uh, delightful, intelligent, insightful, and actually 
pretty funny. Sarah Tavel's oh. on the podcast. Didn't expect that. You got I, a sense of I humor. I was never expecting that either. You got a sense of humor about oh. you. You're pretty candid. Oh. <laughs> now I know why they brought you in. You're oh. candid. When it's you a blessing or a curse, I'm not quite sure yet. I think uh, once in a while, your candidness as New Yorkers mm. can get taken the wrong way here in the, on the West Coast, correct? Yes, You've had this experience where oh, you're yeah. like, whoa, mm-hmm. that was candid. <laughs> <laughs> but that's somewhere in the fifth or tenth year being out here. You just know. Yeah. Keep it in fourth gear. Keep it yeah, in third yeah, yeah. gear. You, you, people are just not ready for the New York bluntness. The New Yorker, yeah. Like, when you're in New York and somebody's walking slow, you're like, can you move? Oh, my God. Can you please I actually move? honk at people. <laughs> I mean, the thing in New York that's crazy is, since we left, it's turned into- oh, my wife kills me about it. <laughs> it's turned into Paris. Like, there's more tourists yeah. than New Yorkers, and they're all spinners. Yeah. They, they walk, they oh, stop. Don't get me they started. They look up and they start spinning around. Don't get me I'm started. I'm like, this is not a yeah. pinball machine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get the yeah, yeah, out of the yeah. way. If you want to stop and take pictures, we're trying I'm, to get to work. I fantasize about the fast lane and the slow lane. and This has got to happen. <laughs> yes. They need to stop everybody who's a... If you're coming to New York... Jason, I feel like you and I have a connection. We here. do. <laughs> we do. It's just it's locked in as New Yorkers living in Cali. I drive like a taxi driver here. It's terrible. <laughs> How many speeding tickets you get out here so far? Uh, no comment. <laughs> I put the over-under at three. <laughs> and I might take the over in that bet. No comment. I got three in three years. If you could get speeding tickets by walking on the sidewalk, I would be yes. I'd be in jail at this point. Like I'm the fast. I have just you, you got to zigzag. Yeah. yeah, and then also this idea that like there's no cars coming, and we're going to sit here on the stop. corner. <laughs> I know. I mean, what's the point of that? I actually got in trouble. A police car pulled me over when I did that once for jaywalking. Yeah, he he was he. Whoop, whoop. I I crossed because there was no cars coming, and it you know that's your right. Seemed like safe to You're me. You're taking the risk, and You're he right. literally ran up to me and stopped me in San Francisco. In San Francisco, in the Tenderloin. Okay, and you're like, bruh. I know. <laughs> they're selling cr- those guys. I j- there's crack in his hand right now. <laughs> that person's handing meth to an individual, I and know. that person has a needle in their neck shooting <laughs> I was, up heroin. I and was, you're pulling me over. I was. I actually. I looked. Sh- I was shocked, and I just said, "Thank you, officer." And he's like, "I'm just worried about your safety." I was like. <laughs> Thank you, officer. <laughs> See, but that's that's you're also a New Yorker because you understand how to interface with the police. Oh yeah. It's yeah. just you just I mean, say there's like two I'm, or three things you say to a cop. Yes, officer. No, officer. Thank you, thank officer. officer. Yes, that's it. Yes, you say those three words over and over again. The interaction is going to be mm-hmm. very short. Four to five times, it's a warning. Yep. It's when you say like, "Why are you stingling me out?" It's like, "Okay, it's on now." Yeah, exactly. Now it's on. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I'm just, you walked across the street against the red light in front of me, and then you gave me bunk. Like, okay, well now we're going to have to. This is no longer stop and frisk. Oh this my is. God. You know, I was waiting for a ticket, but thankfully he didn't give me one. I was hoping. And I got. I got. I had this happen to me in Santa Monica, which, mm. where they're very serious about it, and they yeah. do have a little bit more edge about it because they will give you a ticket. Yeah. Because people do get killed, and there's a there's a lot of car traffic, and people yeah. do get killed sadly or hit. Um, and they also didn't have any crime at the time there, so the cops had nothing to do. Mm. So that was their broken window. Hey, when we left. Um, I really want to get into uh, Hip Camp yeah. and the pitch on that one because I know the company well. But chain alis- Chainalysis. Chainalysis. Yeah. That was the first one. This is a did. crypto one? It is a crypto one. I am shocked that you did a crypto investment. When I, did you do that one? I did it, you know, October 2018. Okay. So we're coming out of the ICO madness. No, it was... It was during the ICO madness. Oh, wait. Yeah, madness. that's peak. I'm yeah. sorry that you meant 2019. Yeah, yeah. So you're in peak ICO madness. Yes. We all know those ICOs as mm-hmm. investors were giant frauds. Crazy. And you take your first deal, put it on the triangular table. Yes. And you say, I got it. Yeah. I'm here. I made it. I'm on the Yankees. I want a bunt. I'm doing a crypto yeah, investment. A here we go. Like, this is a non traditional first investment. You could have gone with something safe. Hey, I did Pinterest. Here's my next UGC. Mm-hmm. What well, is. I had a thesis. Analysis? Yeah, let's I hear had it. a thesis. So the thesis was. You know, one of my partners, like when I started at Benchmark, you know, one of the wonderful things about a smaller partnership is that you don't have to choose a lane. Like, it's not that, you know, I'm in, I'm like the consumer social person at right. Benchmark. There's five people and we're covering an entire soccer field. And so you take more space. And so I decided I was going to 
spend more time digging in on the space. And I had kind of an intellectual curiosity around crypto. I had gotten involved with it when I was at Greylock and I was digging in. And then this was, you know, I was reading anything I could, speaking to people. And, and then the ICO stuff started to take off. And yeah. it was like everybody was going towards, you know, investing in ICOs. It was a huge, huge thing. But it was honestly confusing to me because what I, like as I looked at what was happening, it felt like everybody was making these investments in infrastructure with this belief that if they built it, the use cases would come. And and there was, you know, a lot of very highfalutin talk about what the use cases would be if we had the underlying infrastructure. But, you know, one of my partners, Matt Kohler, talks about how our job as investors isn't to predict the future, it's to see the present clearly. Mm. And so when I was looking around at how people were using crypto, what I really saw was a few use cases, which is number one, it was store value, which was largely Bitcoin at the yeah. time. Store value seems to be like you, your country is exploding. Yep. Y you There's, don't want to be in Venezuela dollars. Yeah, yeah. My mom's I'm my, my mom's from Argentina and like, uh -huh. you know, uh, Bitcoin was a real thing in Argentina. And so I understood that use case. Inflation was crazy. Like this is an asset that actually should be deflationary. You can't the, buy dollars. You, yeah, you can't. You can't buy dollars. You can't get money out of the country. Like, right. there's real problems. I mean, in Argentina, amongst many. Yeah. Um, the second was actually fundraising, which is what was happening on Ethereum and right. what was creating the ICO craze. Was it was too good at it was, raising money. That's exactly. But so it was so good they were breaking securities law. There was a lot of that. There was a lot. That, of that. That was it was. It was a, Let's be honest. Yeah. All yeah. of ICOs were securities offerings. It, I ninety eight percent like I, it was. I, I can't. I don't know one. Ninety nine percent. There was. It's incredibly frustrating to me as an angel investor who runs a syndicate to you, watch these local. You would locals. say Ethereum was uh, like a, Ethereum was one of the first, like essentially an ICO, right? And it was like a real utility token. Yeah. What is explain to people? Uh, so this is your second use case. Yeah. Well, the you have money third, store, and then you have raising money. Yeah, and then the third was criminal activity. Which kind of relates to the second, yes, these people and the first. I mean, so like, yeah. what was the like, what was the how are like, what was the use case that you could count on that like, regardless of yeah. whether Bitcoin went up or down, or whether Dogecoin or Ethereum or whatever it is became like the the token du jour. Right. Like, what could you count on? It was that money laundering. It was that drugs. illegal things were going to happen with yes. cryptocurrencies. By the way, with currencies. Correct. Yes. Illegal things Correct. happen with currency. Yes. That's yes. the yes. reason people do illegal things. Generally speaking, people are not doing illegal things for the fun of it. They're doing illegal things for the profit. That and so that so like that actually felt to me like in a way the most expansive uh, use case. Wow. But what am I gonna do as an investor? I'm not gonna invest in like the next Mount Gox or Silk Road. Yeah, like you can't short them. You and you can't short them. Um and and then I, you know, as part of learning and going deep in the space, I was very lucky to have coffee with um, with Katie Hahn, who had been. She this was before she joined Andreessen. Right. She had been a. Um, she was a, a justice department. She was yeah, and she was a prosecutor for the DOJ, and she was involved with the Silk Road case and Mount Gox case. Right. And during like while we were talking about it, because she was an early she's brilliant. She's fantastic a great right. poker player so i hear uh, uh, i haven't played cards with her but i met her once at a conference spent a little time with her spent a couple hours talking to her and it's like really interesting a prosecutor who's yes. now investing yes in currencies that aside from money store some significant portion of it is people who don't want you to know what they've spent <laughs> well, money on well and so what she mentioned when i spoke to her was that while she was at the DOJ doing these prosecutions, she used Chainalysis uh, to do the investigations. Whoa. And so I- well, there's an endorsement. Well, and so I was like, yeah, Where you does know, the DOJ go to solve this problem? Right. So yeah. as a good little VC that I am, You're I like, wrote whoop, the name down whoop. and, and cold emailed zip, zip. The, the CEO, Michael zip, zip, Greninger. Zip, yeah. As we say in the business, zip, yeah. zip, zip. And, and it was, um, what was awesome about it was that I, you know, I spoke to Michael and realized that it was even more than I had anticipated, which was that, yes, it was the tool that the government agencies, you know, US government, but globally were using to do investigations on the Bitcoin blockchain. It was just, it was only Bitcoin at the time where mm. that chain analysis was, was able to do these investigations for, but that it was actually an enabling part of the ecosystem. Mm. Because if you're a regulated <clears throat> entity, if you're a, 
in an exchange. Right. And you are touching both fiat, Real money. U.S. dollars, yeah. uh, and crypto. You need to be able to answer to the same government agencies that are using chain analysis of make like this is the compliance I'm doing to make sure I'm not part of some money laundering scheme. Right. KYC, and, know your customer. That's part of it, but that's part AML of it. is the big one for Which one? AML, anti money laundering. Oh, AML, right. Yeah, yeah. To make so, sure that you're not, you know, part of some some money laundering scheme for a terrorist. Speaking of poker, there was some dipshit kid in uh Vegas during mm. the Bitcoin era. It was like, Oh, you want Bitcoin? Give me a poker chip, I'll give you a thumb drive with a Bitcoin on it. So it's like, well, what does a Bitcoin cost? Like, oh, Bitcoin now costs, uh, let's just pick a number at the time, $2,000. You want a Bitcoin? Give me $2,100. I'll give you a Bitcoin. Give me $2,200. So he's yep. just doing this like arbitrage. Yeah, he's yeah. walking around casinos doing yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in jail. It's like, you're, what you're doing is called laundering of yes. money. Like, there's a yes. reason why when you're at casinos, they, those chips have RFID on them. They know the chain of custody of every poker chip mm. over a certain de denomination. Mm. They probably know it of all of them. So if you and I are at a poker game, in a casino, or and we say like, "Hey, I'll bet you five thousand on the Yankees are going to win, or the Warriors are going to win," and I hand you the five thousand dollar chip. When you go to cash it out, they're like, "Where'd you get the five thousand dollar chip?" Hmm. They know you got it from Jason Calacanis, who lost the bet. They're just waiting to see where wow. you, what your answer is. And you're like, "I picked it up off the floor." Yeah, and they're like, "Yeah, no, you got to go get that person and bring them here." Yeah, yeah. AML is one of these things that it it's part of businesses that you would never guess. Like, I mean, uh, Airbnb had to worry about money laundering, you know, because people would really? create fake uh, <gasps> fake locations and then pay as if they were a traveler <gasps> to the host and they would just use that to wow. money, launder money. And so there's all these companies have to be aware of it and, right. and, and have the ability to do the compliance to make sure that they are not sub no, they're not a victim of it or being mm -hmm. used to do it right. and that they can you know do the work to not just be you know to do do the investigations if they get contacted by a government agency but right. to catch them also right um, crazy and so chain analysis was using this and creating a, a data moat really around all the analytics that they were doing on on the bitcoin blockchain and they were kind of a classic software business where they were doing a few million dollars of annualized revenue had only raised a million and a half or so. <gasps> yum, yum. And that was, yeah, yum, yum. That yum, was, yum. Uh, as, as, and so it as was, we say in the yeah. News. And so it was a little bit like there's, this is, you know, it's real. It's a, I called it uh, actually Michael once he, he thought this was so funny. I call it a meat and potatoes company in crypto mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, it's, it's a vertical SaaS company. Yeah. It just happens to be in crypto. Is there what, when you look at crypto, do you think there's an Amazon that's going to come out of this? Is a Google or an Uber going to well, come I mean, out of it? You would say Bitcoin already is a, the I, Amazon. I mean, what an right, incredible okay. success story! Right, highly manipulated. That's my theory. Oh, there's there's definitely massive. Manipulation. There's been a lot of manipulation. I think uh, Chainalysis has actually published a report on yeah, that recently. The, they call it painting the tape. It's a fascinating mm. concept that came out of. It's it's a term that. Uh, well, should definitely Brian Koppelman should definitely make a billions episode out of this. Painting the tape was a technique where people would take a stock that didn't have a lot of volume. Yeah. And let's say you and I own a bunch of the stock. We then get a bunch of brokerage accounts and we start trading between each other. So we're losing five percent or two percent on the trades, whatever yeah. we're paying a vig to somebody. But with Bitcoin, you can do this without paying that much of a vig if you're doing peer to peer transfer, mm -hmm. right? Now there's volume. Mm -hmm. Oh, volume's increasing. Volume's increasing. Maybe it's going up just a little bit, but people go, oh, wow, there's a lot of volume here. And when yeah. people look at the cryptos after like XR, when you look at that coin market cap yeah. and you look at the volume, that volume is fugazi. Yeah, yeah. There's no way that's true. Yeah. It can't be. No, a lot of it's exchanges trading with themselves. And so consumers are like, oh, $10 billion traded mm -hmm. in crypto today? It's like, really? Mm -hmm. You really think there was 10? That's a big number. Yeah. There's not $10 billion of crypto. So if you paint the tape and you tick it up a little bit and then a phenomenon happens that it went up 3% a day. Mm. So you and I paint the tape. We're the original yeah. Bitcoin owners at 10 cents or 5 cents. We just start painting the tape and we're, you know, chopping up the, you know, raising costs. We do this with, you know, millions of accounts potentially, tens of thousands of accounts. Wallets can be created in some programmatic way with software. Tape gets painted. All these people watching the news, you plan a couple of news stories, it's going up 3% a day, 3% compounded. There was compounded, a lot of this. Is in 35 days, we're going to double. 
Yeah, yeah. There were a lot of Telegram groups that were doing basically what you articulate. I yeah. mean, pump. They called them yeah, pump, pump and pump, dumps. Pump. Yeah. Pump. They, yeah. Literally, I went into those Telegram mm-hmm. groups and it was pump, pump, pump with yeah. the name of the group. I know. You spent remember, some time there, I too? remember those. Yeah, of course. And it's like, we're all going to buy this coin mm-hmm. on Sunday. Yep. But remember, we're not selling until Saturday. I'm like, the person who created this group has already bought their coins. <laughs> By the way, dipshits. Like, yeah. The per- whoever created this group is selling their selling their coins to you as part of the pump, pump, pump. And we'll see who the bag holder yeah, is. There was a lot of that. So I, I like that approach. That's a good one. Yeah. Any pushback from when you, is that we were talking before how a partnership works? No, Do you I, need consensus? Do you, can somebody block each other or are there no rules officially? Um, well, so we, we, we do vote and there is kind of the idea that I, I think it's like, I, I don't know if it's average or number of people. It's just, it's generally, <laughs> it's probably average. Like, and I say probably because like, honestly, we've never, while I've been at Benchmark, like the, the way we think about it is like we a company comes in to present mm-hmm. and we have a conversation about the the company. It's a very truth seeking conversation. And right. it's not a conversation where I'm like defending the company or right. selling the company. It's really this conversation because when when we invest in a company, like the only way we can do our job with five people versus like the two hundred at Andreessen right. is to really work as a team. And when, you know, when we invest in a company, it's not just Sarah's investing in this company, it's benchmark isn't investing in the company. You know, it's part of the part of the benchmark right. family. And so it's a very truth seeking conversation, but and a lot of things come out of it like, oh, we should look into this and this and this, or you know, you get a sense of the sentiment and and you don't actually ask for a vote mm. unless you really are ready to do the deal. Got it. And so the so, act of asking for a vote means you're committed. Yeah. Well it means like you kind of you're ready to do the deal. Yeah. You're ready. And 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 for the most part, and like and while I've been at benchmark, we've never gone to a vote and then not gone support. There's mm-hmm. a little bit of this understanding that if you're bringing this company to a vote, it means you want to do the deal. And unless right. like I have a real point of view, and and look, I brought a company to a vote once, and you know we we go on a ten point scale, and mm-hmm. I got a three on one of them, you know, and it. Wasn't wow. one that I ended up doing, but it was like I was almost there to do the deal, right. and and someone had a real reason to not like it, and you know I spent more time on that and ended up being wow. right. But so you, but is it anonymous part, when they do the score? No, no, no. You we you just put it out. Yeah, there. does but everybody we don't, do three, two, one, and turn over? No, 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 we you kind of we write it on a sheet of paper wow. and give it to the person. Wow. Yeah. And the person just reads Because you don't want anybody to influence. That's like, what I was thinking. Yeah. It's very, yeah, this is yeah. why when I do voting at, at our events or whatever, I yeah. hate having people go first because I watch people right. change their votes because they're like, oh, a oh, group I think totally hits agree. in. But the best companies, aren't they polarizing? That's, you know. Is that true or not? I, we, I don't, I don't know. Um, at Benchmark, well, I'll say this. At Greylock, uh, we would talk about that a lot, actually, that some of the best investments um, were polarizing. Facebook is the one of the more famous examples where right. David Z got a note from one of the more senior partners that this investment was going to ruin the firm. You know, it was like that type of... Um, <laughs> really, you know, $3 million going to yeah, ruin yeah. the firm. And even, you know, Airbnb, which, which Reed did, um, was on one... Oh, you know, on, on one hand, it was an obviously incredible company. I mean, clear network effects, growing really quickly, yeah. a marketplace, like the type of business that Reed l- like salivates over. Yeah, live for. Yeah. yeah. And on the other hand, it was, I think, 5% ownership, you know? And so yeah. all the time, you know, as VCs, we're talking about we want to get a real ownership yeah. stake to be worth the time. And right. so there was some... Um, you know, some polarity on that point. Right. Um, but for the most part, like the belief is, is that if you, if a company is great, there's going to be at least one other strong advocate for that company. Um, that's what we believed at, at Greylock. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's by and large pretty true. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly exceptions. Uh, why are people obsessed with ownership percentage in RU? Well, we, we really are. And the reason, the reason is, is, it, it, there's a couple of different reasons, but number one is like for, for benchmark, like, again, we have zero leverage in our system, you know, like we're not a firm where people are taking on 20 boards because there's just no fucking way we could do that. Yeah. Right. Like we have, 
there's nobody to whom I can say, do this, right. you know, find help this person find the CRO or uh, do the analysis, kind of dig into the financials for me. Like we are doing all the work ourselves. And so our, we're not able to scale ourselves. Mm. And that means that each time we make an investment, we have to make that investment really count, right. you know, and, and we make it count because we're doing a lot of work on it. And hopefully that has a real positive benefit to the company itself. But we also make sure that we're, you know, able to buy as much of the company as we can when we invest because right. we actually have a small fund. And so we don't tend to be the group that's then doubling down each round after that. Right. It's really about that, you know, first investment. And then pro rata from there. Well, we don't, we you know, I th we don't go heavy on the pro rata. We're not the group that is saying, like, defend our pro rata. We're the group that says, look, I have to be internally consistent. And mm -hmm. usually when we invest, because we're trying to get as much ownership, it means the difficult conversation of to the seed investors of how, what's the right way to allocate pro rata. Mm -hmm. But then when the next round happens, we're not going to, you know, speak out of both sides of our mouth. And, right. and so, so you'll step back. And step back to make the financing successful. Right. Yeah, I got bullied a lot uh, in my imagine. early days as an yeah, angel, yeah. where it's like, you got to give up your pro rata. And now I don't. I would for Bill Gurley. I would for Sequoia. I would for Chamath. Well, and I think that's always the conversation, which is... But I'll take half. You know, like, I'll, I'll, I'll negotiate yeah. a little bit, because I don't want people rolling over me. Yeah. And, and look, like, I don't want... If someone's creating value for the company, I don't want to take value away from them. I want right. them to continue to be right. adding value. But as you know, what happens a lot for these companies is that there are a lot of people around the table right. and they're, you know, they're not creating value and the founder has to be optimizing right. for the future value of the company. Right. You invested your second deal as a camping yeah. startup. Yes, hip camp. Hip camp. Mm -hmm. Now most people would be like, camping startup? Mm -hmm. Really? This yeah. It's not venture scale. I had the same reaction when I looked at the seed. However. Yeah. You got Airbnb, and you got a couple of other trends going on. People may or may not know this, but every time I've tried to go to Yosemite, yes, no vacancy, impossible. So I go to the Evergreen Lodge, which is outside the entrance, mm. which is charming. It's like an old '50s lodge, like in the Catskills, where yeah. everybody eats the same time. There's two seatings for dinner, and it's prefix, and then they have marshmallows for kids. They got all the activities for kids going on three regular days, so all this good stuff. I like that better. Yeah. But to get into Half Dome or into like the 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 valley and stay there, I, I think you have to book a year, I was told, or yeah. something, or six months. So there's something going on that people <laughs> want to get back to nature. That's exactly it. Is that it? Oh, that's a huge part what of it. What was your thesis on this? I mean, the thesis, so look, I had the same reaction when I met Alyssa for the seat. I met her at Greylock, mm -hmm. um, and I was super impressed by her. But I had a similar reaction to what you articulated, which is that, it's like, I don't know, like, it does it feel big? It doesn't, mm. f like, camping, like, you know, it's just a niche audience. Mm. And and there was, there was something that was starting to work, but it was still incredibly early, and she hadn't really figured out how to acquire supply. Mm. Like, she had maybe a handful of hosts, but it wasn't a machine yet. And so there was a little bit for me of the combination of not really knowing how to acquire supply, which, as you know, f um, for marketplaces is, a really, you know, 90% of the time, the first step is to aggregate supply, mm. that it just didn't feel like she had totally figured that out. And I wasn't, I didn't have conviction on the magnitude of the opportunity. And so I, I passed. And what ended up happening is we we stayed in touch. Mm. Um, I, I um, spent a lot of time, I mean, I led product uh, at Pinterest for the discovery team. And so we would end up doing some product sessions, you know, and like digging in together. So this, how can we be, how can I be helpful and being helpful even though you don't have equity yet? Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. People, the, the new VC brags and how can I be helpful? All this like yeah. anti or, or like mocking VC Twitter, which I'm interested in your position on. I love it. I love it. I <laughs> you love it? It's so great. Course, of course. Why is everybody blocking these? Oh I'm watching God. like Naval's blocking, yeah, yeah, Alexis yeah. is blocking. I think it's- I just watch everybody block them and I'm like, is, do you guys not have a sense of humor? They're I, breaking exactly. your chops. Exactly. Yeah, You're yeah. wearing a fleece vest, drinking $7 coffee. My favorite one right now is the VCs congratulating themselves. It's so great. Just three claps. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to link bait them with my tweets. <laughs> And I, so they I tweeted. They should just automatically retweet they won't, you. Dude, they won't. <laughs> and I, this is my big existential problem is I'm so laughable in my own behavior yeah. that I'm not parable. You can't parody me. 
I'm uncancelable. Are you our, our tr- the Trump of venture? That's what some. <laughs> that's what Kara Swisher is trying to do, and I'm like, please don't do that because I'm not a horrible human being. I actually care, and I go to work, and I'm, I like to think I'm smart. Maybe. <laughs> Go to Tyerson, but I'm not an idiot. <laughs> but maybe, okay, maybe. <laughs> Tremendous portfolio, okay. A couple of unicorns, six, seven. <laughs> Stop counting, okay. Uh, but how can I be helpful? Which is parodied is yeah. actually it's so like it, it's 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 a genuine thing. Most it's of a the real time. thing. Yeah, you want to be helpful. Yeah, because it feels good to be helpful. There's no, you wouldn't be in this business if you didn't want to be helpful. Yeah, it's the, it's a service based business. Yes, yeah, exactly. All right. So since it's a ser- so you pitched everybody. Oh, so, so how did you so, get past? Well, you know what happened. Know? It was funny. Like I, you know, what what we do when we when we have a company that you're spending time in is we we pass the ball to one of the other partners. You have another partner, uh, and usually you figure out who's the partner who's the best fit mm-hmm. to like help you figure out whether we should make the investment or right. not. And you know, I like I had been spending time with Alyssa. And you could tell that something was really starting to work. Like mm. she had cracked the code on what acquiring supply. Oh, okay. Huge. Supply is very important Huge. in a marketplace. And then the classic thing of a marketplace, which is that if you unlock supply, demand follows. Right. And that was exactly what was happening is that she was unlocking supply and you would just see the correlation, you right. know, um, the economics. And supply in this case was a landowner. Correct. Because she was on the pod. I forgot which episode. Uh, I'll get the number right now, but. Oh, no, actually, I do know. It's episode 959. Uh, Alyssa Ravazio. Mm -hmm. She's dynamic. I was taken by her. I was like, this is a killer founder. Yeah, yeah, she's very compelling. Self-possessed. That's the word, right? Like self-possessed. Yeah. I think uh, I've been really focused on that word because I think I heard Michael, um, what's the author's name who did? uh, Lewis? Michael Lewis. Somebody asked Michael Lewis, like, what do you... What do what all your subjects have in common? And he's, mm. I think he said self-possessed. Mm, interesting. You know, they have this like sense of- Yeah, who they are. Who they are. You're not going to like knock them out of their seat. Yeah. You know, if you criticize them or whatever, they're just, they, yeah, they know yeah. what they're doing. Yeah, they know yeah. where they're going. They know why they're doing what they're doing. Mm. They got like a sort of samurai Jedi like mm. confidence to them. Yeah. You know, like a good Jedi is not like, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do next week. It's like, yeah. well, I'm a Jedi. I know exactly what I'm doing next week. I'm going to be a Jedi. That's what I do. But unlocking the supply. Yeah. So she was unlocking the supply. Demand Which is was following. Correct. Um, How do you get a landowner? Well, to say let some random San Francisco hippie yuppies yeah. go camp camp on my yeah, land. Yeah. Sounds risky to me. Well, and lawsuit so, coming. You know. Well, and and it's like one of the key things for any marketplace is how do you create trust, right? right? And so one of the things that Hip Camp has now and had then is is an insurance policy, so they can kind of allay that fear. Right. And and there's there's a culture with Hip Campers where it's you know leave it better than you you kind of found it, you know. Right. And sure. so leave only uh, take memories, leave footprints. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's what we were told as Boy Scouts. Like you just you take. Oh, you the were memory. a Boy Scout. Of course I was. Yeah. From New York? That what people don't understand is when you're a city kid, yeah. They want to get you out of the city. I totally get that. So we would go up to Ten Mile River Camp. Uh Jewish kids would go to Catskills, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're Jewish. I never right? yeah, I'm Jewish. Yeah. Never went to the Catskills. So well, you said your dad would argue about religion. I'm just thinking like, well, so he's either Catholic yeah. or Jewish. Because no. those are the few people who are arguing. Yes. <laughs> um Yeah. Well, and so I'll um um the other thing that I realized with Hip Camp, just kind of back to the conversation on how big could this get, right. was was twofold. Which is one, I realized that one of the things that was special that was happening was that, you know, it was progressing from just campers to glampers. You yes. know, because landowners change. huge change, and landowners were investing in their land. They were adding a tree house or a yurt or a tent, which right. was opening up the addressable market yeah, for the aperture Hip Camp. Was bigger, which exactly. is why I'm with Airbnb because it used yes. to be couch surfing, but not families right. and not business travelers. Yeah, and yeah. now they have business accounts, and this for business travelers are like I much prefer to stay in an apartment with a. You know, uh, yeah, kitchen. Uh, yeah, and it's classic marketplace, which is you start with a really small niche, you nail it, mm-hmm. you get it, like you make people really happy, Beach and then head. you expand from there. Yes. Beachhead, wedge strategy, what do you call it? I mean, I kind of think of it as like just the, you know, the bullseye, the red hot center, uh, yeah. and then you expand from super there. Super important. Yes, yeah, super important. Why? Um, because that's the only way to build liquidity in a marketplace is you what get- What does it mean, liquidity? 
well, for people who haven't heard that term. Most people, like, I kind of call it the Dilbert version, which is, okay. it's just the efficiency with which you match a buyer and a seller. Got it. Uh, the way I think of it, I call it the hippie version, is right. like, just the happiness that both the buyers and sellers have when they transact. And, and mm -hmm. I think about it as happiness, not just efficiency, because it's more than just how efficient the match is and do you have the right supply? It's right. about the product. You know, yes. it's about the policies you use. Like, how do you delight You're a so user and right. make it? How did you unpack that and learn that? Did you operate an Airbnb or how did you get that, the happiness and the joy between the two parties? Because I'm operating an Airbnb for the last six months. Yeah. And I... We, we do a text message to mm -hmm. people when they're coming in. Yeah. And in the text message, we remind them, no parties, 10 people, there's a security camera, quiet time at 10, yeah. all the stuff. If you want to have a party or a photo shoot or anything like that, there's a separate prize. Yes. You can you can request a quote for that. Um, and we do it for that reason because we had a party um, and people denied they knew that. So we started making it really explicit. But we also started putting in my picks, best mm. ice cream, yes. best ramen, Yes. best delivery on Uber Eats, best delivery on Postmates, and we would give them these things and yeah. then say best activities. Mm -hmm. Half Moon Bay, you know, here's how to go to the Presidio, here's Pacifica, here's all kinds of things you do. People started taking our suggestions and then writing us back on the SMS. Then Holy. we would tell them, hey, thanks for staying. And we also left a gift basket out, mm. which nobody does. Yep. And then we started getting crazy reviews. Yeah. Then the trust happens. You get the reviews. Hold now on. the place books like crazy. We just got them. A uh, very famous NBA player who wants to stay mm. at the place for three months or whatever. Mm. I was like, "Whoa, well, that's interesting." Yeah. No, it's it's and it's about that joy. I like operating it. Forget about the finances. I just like being a host. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, and I just was reflecting, I guess, on why, like, you look at Goat, like the, the shoe, the seller. shoe company, yeah. um, the shoe marketplace. Like, you guys invested in that? No, I wish. I wish. There's we Goat, didn't. and then there's StockX. Yes, yeah, we had StockX on the pod. Oh, cool. Goat hasn't come on. No goat. Have we tried goat? Or we just... We, we got to work on it. They have a great story. I've never... Why I've never no met. goat? What's up with goat? Uh -oh. They're, what are they, Someone's protesting? getting in trouble right now. Goat ghosted? J. Cal? Yeah. 200 plus thousand views per episode? <laughs> it could be a little jelly. They're a little jelly on the sock X. All right. Well, well the story... You know, one of the things that you, you can't help but reflect on for goat is... Imagine, you know, you, you're looking at this incumbent eBay. Mm. They're massive. Yes. They have, like, you are this little startup, and you have, like, zero inventory. And they have liquidity. And, and well, eBay. Uh, eBay, massive yeah, liquidity. Massive, you would think. But then right. there's, like, there's this vulnerability, which is actually the catalyst for the company. The founder, they were working on another company, uh -huh. and they, uh, it was not working, running on fumes at this point, looking for a pivot. And the founder had ordered a pair of shoes off of eBay, got them, and they were counterfeits. Oh, and it There's was kind a pain of, point. That's a real pain point, right? Yeah, you and spent six hundred on your you, Yeezys, and they're not exactly. real. Exactly. No, and that's that's. Wah, um, wah. And so what Goat realized was that the, there was a real unmet need here, and it wasn't it wasn't like a you know liquidity, just like the, that Dilbert version of liquidity. You kind of think, oh, I just have to add more supply, more supply, more supply. Right. That wasn't but then the how issue. are you ever going to disrupt an incumbent? Right. And you do it because Goat made a better pod product. Mm. Like there's all these things you can do. If you, you, you're you looking for that pair of Yeezys and they don't have your size, you leave a notification, like set a, set a reminder or right. a notification if they, right. they get it. And just the data normalization, because you're doing one vertical, so you have much. complete data so on much. the category, which yes. like eBay's, they might have complete data of eBay Motors because there's a lot at stake, but right. they're not going into yeah, shoes. Yeah, yeah. The taxonomy, how to do the search. And taxonomy, then of course, better word. And then the most important thing, which is that kind of assurance of authenticity. And so mm. that is, you kind of have to, like, if you're, and I'm a product person, like, that's just who I am. And so yeah. you can't help but think more expansively and realize that there's something about the happiness and how happy someone yeah. is. Like, and that's why part of what you want to do with a marketplace when you're starting is you want to really, really focus because it's a classic, like, if you try to make everybody happy, you'll make no one happy. Exactly. Right? You got to, you got to go deep. Yeah. Uh, all and, right. And then, and sorry. So then just to loop back to yeah. Hip Camp. I introduced Bill to it, and he Bill was basically Gurley. like, well, if you don't do this, I will, type thing. Oh, um, that's a great reaction. And that's, you know. That's and as so, good as it gets. And look, like, I was leaning in, like, I wanted to do it, but then to have that confirmation that there was, mm. you know, and it's kind of back to the gray lock, like, 
if you don't get at least one other person to mm. be as enthusiastic as you are, then yeah. you might be standing alone. Um, it was a it was a good sign. All right, listen, I've kept you for a long time. Uh, you can follow Sarah Tavel T A V E L <laughs> on the Twitter. Are you active on the Twitter? I am. Yeah. All right. Oh, wow. Here we go. Mark Adreesen, you know, he's a huge fan of the show and he doesn't do any <laughs> meetings anymore. All he does is like listen to the pod and he's texting me like all the time. It's the critique is that I'm like, Mark, I do this for a living. I don't need to t you to tell me that I'm talking over Sarah or like literally that was his feedback on the last episode. You keep talking over the guests. Let him talk. I'm like, okay. Okay, Mark. Oh, anyway, he's listening right now. Congrats to Peter on hiring you. Can you give me some New York City recommendations for my upcoming trip to Manhattan? Great question, Mark. Yeah, yeah. I'll send I, I like you my Pinterest question. board, Mark. You have a Pinterest board? Yeah. Uh, you got a you got a favorite uh, favorite. Uh, oh, New York has changed so much. It's so I, weird going it's back, crazy. isn't it? It's so weird going it's back. Really I walk around. Changed. I'm like, wh who put up these? I know. Weird. Big thirty buildings. story, sixty story, like hundred ten story buildings yeah, yeah, yeah. that look like a Jenga. Yeah, <laughs> it's a weird situation. But yes. I'll give you uh, the place I love to go when I go there now. Decoy. Oh yeah, you know Decoy? I think so. The the, the duck place. Yeah. And then what's it, what's the name of the other restaurant upstairs? He's got two restaurants on top of each other. Anyway, this guy I mean, he's a Jewish chef mm. who is obsessed with Chinese food. So he's hybrided it. So he's got a pastrami dumpling. Whoa. He puts like pastrami that he makes, Jewish style, into a like fried dumpling Chinese style. But he also got obsessed with um, Peking duck. So he makes downstairs in a place called oh Decoy I'm gonna a certain a number of Peking tomorrow. ducks. <laughs> it is so unbelievable. I rent out, they have a communal table. That's why I know of it, because I'm obsessed with Peking duck. That's, That's like, my obsession. I am obsessed. Have you been to Hong Kong recently? Oh, like actual Hong Kong. Actual Hong Kong. Uh, like, 10 years ago. Mott 32 okay. is the best Peking duck right now in the world, I think. Uh, they do it so perfectly. They cut it so perfectly. Oh, my God. Beautiful. The best Peking duck here is that Hakkasan. Yes. I'm so with you. It's Jason, unbelievable. I feel a kinship What here. is going on here, Sarah? <laughs> we could have met I know. in our 20s. I know. beautiful. <laughs> and this could have been it. But I don't think... I think we're on different teams. Different right? teams. You're sorry. married to a woman. Yes, <laughs> So it wouldn't have worked out. But we could have been besties. <laughs> we could have been besties. It feels like we could have been besties in New York. <laughs> we definitely have a Peking duck in our future. Let's do it. Let's do Let's it. Let's do it. <laughs> Look at us. It's the best. Look at us. Yeah. <laughs> Who would have thought it? <laughs> Not me. Not me. <laughs> this is my, do you know that Paul Rudd clip? The viral no, clip? No. There's a viral cri clip of yeah. Paul Rudd. Okay. On a show called like Hot Wings. And all they do on this Hot Wings show is eat wings. <laughs> and increasingly hotter sauce. And he doesn't know why he's on this. He's a movie star. And he's on a YouTube show about oh eating hot God. wings. And he goes, at one point, the guy's like, look at us. And he's like, yeah, look at us. He's like, who'd have thought it? And Paul Rudd just looks at him and goes, not me. And it's just the greatest. Roll the clip of Paul Rudd. All right, listen, Sarah, you crushed it. Thanks for coming on the pod. Continued success. Uh, and uh, I really would like to get a little slice of hip camp. If you do another round. All right, appreciate can that. Can you just put a good word for me with Alyssa? I'm, I'm talking like, I just want to maybe 500K, maybe 750. Just let me sneak in to get a little slice on the B. I'll have to send this to Alyssa and make the, make the ask. I'm asking Alyssa right now on the <laughs> pod. Give me a slice, I'll go, and I tell you what. When you hit when you hit your next milestone, we'll do an episode of the pod. Mm. I'll, I'll I'll offer a podcast episode All to right. get an idea. I like the barter. We'll barter right yeah. now. Let's horse trade. We'll do an episode. Me, you, her, Peking duck from a year. Oh. We'll get the I'll get the Peking duck from Hakkasan. I'll have them ride it up to the yurt. The three of us do. You know whatever. how to play to your audience. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll get do. on that cap table. I'll you get do. on a benchmark <laughs> cap table. Let's do it. All right. We'll see you all next time on Angel. Dude, you crushed it. Thank well you. done. That was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs>